Just watching my ass. Oh, what's up, dude? That guy? Yeah. I'm hacked out on the top. So, we're gonna, we're gonna get started, and um, I wish I, I was just telling Michael in the front, I wish I had control over room assignments. I don't. And, but when I get out of here, maybe I'll see if I can get the set. You guys are on 932. So maybe I can, is that right? Yeah, maybe we can find a bigger house to go to. Um, anyway, it's uh, my pleasure this morning to introduce two, uh, I want to refer to them as friends. I've just met Jonathan. I feel like he's my friend, but I've known Nai Wang for a while. Um, Nai is the founder and president of KP Compass Curriculum. Yep. And um, <laughs> he's pretty excited about that. And Jonathan is the Chief Strategy Officer. What I want to say before I begin is that um, in my quest for the epic win, um, I've been really studying the brain, studying like what is, it, what is it that gets everybody so damn excited about playing video games? And what gets them to remember more things about a video game than they could ever remember about anything I ever taught any of the students I engaged with. And um, so over the course of that time, last year I was doing a, a keynote at the, uh, comp the, the National Conference for Career Tech Educators, and I bumped into Nye. Um, and Nye and I, since then, have been communicating regularly. He's, uh, both he and Jonathan are gamers at heart, and they're educators as well. They're trying to merge the field of gaming and educating. And I think, um, some of you may know, I, I've been working now at Penn Closet, a big online house that we're just beginning to develop a new platform. And we've been searching all over the country for the right thing to do. And we've been finding lots of companies doing things. But there's always this one small engine, kind of like the little engine that could that kept coming in front of some of the best technology people I know and saying, they've got the stuff to make a real dramatic, epic change in education. And so um, I'm excited to have Nye and Jonathan here this morning, and I'm going to let them uh, take over. You have to tell yours, guys. <laughs> All right, uh, Ray, thank you so much for that. <laughs> God, listen, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And, uh, and you know, with, with that introduction, uh, from Ray, I mean, it's just been a pleasure you know, working with him. It's, it's, it's so amazing how the synergy happened because like you know, everything that people imagine and talk about, you know, and the things that I dream about, um, I'm trying to make happen. And, and when I met Ray and he was expressing gaming and everything like that, I'm like, oh, that's exactly what we're doing. You know, we're really pushing the envelope. Can you guys hear me in the back? Yeah. All right, great. So, so, so thank you, Ray, so much for everything. Yeah. So, uh, moving on. KB Compass, Game Theory, High Rigor, Online Accountability, Content Mastery. We did this because we want to change learning. So, I'm going to go through these slides really quickly here because we've already been inundated by, yes, everything's broken, yes, everything's good. So, testing system broken, yeah. The textbooks of today, I mean, of yesterday, <laughs> don't fit with the students of tomorrow. I mean, that's a very important thing. We all know that. The textbooks need to change. Uh, there's a technology gap in education, and we need a picture there, but we couldn't find one because there was nothing that was really good for it. And then, uh, you know, actually, that's not quite true. We decided last night we weren't going to put a picture just so we could tell a funny joke. And guys there we go. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the content that's provided has, like, you know, has low accountability, rigor and relevance, and there's lack of student engagement. So all these things stack up to form the overall oh. teacher. <laughs> Anybody feel like this? Yeah. yeah. All right, a few hands. So I guess the rest of you are okay, right? <laughs> or or you, you haven't had enough coffee yet. I don't know. <laughs> all right, so what we need is a revolution. What we need is a revolution and a change in education. So I'm going to go through the agenda really quickly here. We're going to first talk about linear versus nonlinear <laughs> curriculum. Is this, then basically we're going to take you through the process of like, you know, how our minds work. And it's a very scary place. So, so through that process, I'm going to make you guys think about what we thought about as we're going through uh, our, our action. And we're going to talk about classical testing versus concept mastery. Uh, we're going to show the, the, the program in action so you can actually see how it how forms and functions throughout the process. Then we're going to talk about how it all comes together in game theory. 
Then we're going to talk about data analytics though. Data is a big thing in education. It's something that we have never harnessed before until recently. And then how it all ties to regular relevance. So, John? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to start by saying that this has been a very enlightening conference for me. We, you'll probably find out over the next hour we're definitely not trained speakers. Uh, we're both developers. <laughs> Most of the time we sit behind a computer. I um, forgot to mention that. <laughs> yeah, you'll know here in a bit, but um, you don't know already. But basically, this conference has been great because we do go to a lot of education conferences. We try to stay learning. We try to stay engaged with the educators out there. Um, but one thing that I noticed here is that there's so many more people who know what we're talking about. When, when I've gone to the sessions, such as Kuglin and everybody mentioning flip classes, uh, Warford, um, it's amazing how many people recognize it now. So I can see the dramatic shift that's happening, and I think that's not only a testament to the movement, but also to ICLE, the work that they're doing, and all of you educators. And Law Schools Conference. Yeah, Law yeah. Schools Conference, exactly. Um, so having said that, a little bit about my story. Um, I definitely didn't fit the academic model perfectly. Uh, admittedly, I got into some trouble when I was younger, a little bit of a rebellious kid. Um, so I'm sure you can, some of you relate to that. In school, I wasn't challenged. Uh, what that basically meant is I went through a lot of different educational processes. Uh, wilderness school. I did an 18-month wilderness school program with, that completely reformed my view on education. Uh, what that meant is that I was about three years behind the curve. And when I went through the school, I was able to do three years' worth of curriculum in about three and a half months. Um, some of the things about you know, student-centered learning and a different approach to the model that we teach kids is some of the things that I really believe in, so I'm glad to be able to share that with nine up uh, now. But basically, uh, I did public and private, I went to international <coughs> school, and it all ended with me actually joining the military, going into intelligence, and which is obviously an oxymoron for any of you who know the military. <laughs> well, not there anymore, but um, <clears throat> two tours there, and I really got to do a lot of different mobile technology through the military while I was deployed. So I really kind of, it all came together, and when I met Nye, I was just really excited to be involved with these projects. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Yeah, but, uh, John's got a very interesting story. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see in the first slide here, I was made in Taiwan. And I, got, I got exported here when I finally ripened at the age of two. It's a good time to go. And then uh, and with all the other stuff that comes from Taiwan that breaks, right? And, and I came here uh, from uh, Taiwan. You know, I grew up and was raised in a Chinese restaurant, practically speaking. You know, every day I would come home from school, go to the restaurant with my family, you know, do my homework there. Yeah, you know, it was a very uh, difficult life. I, had, uh, I was also English as a second language. I had to go to speech school uh, when I was in gra grammar school. And as you can tell, I have a very thick Chinese accent, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think they did a good job with that. I also um, would have had ADHD. Well, actually, I, I would have been diagnosed with ADHD but because I was a very hyper crazy kid when I was younger. My parents didn't control me. I had a lot of energy. But fortunately, they weren't well enough, well off enough to be able to take me to a psychiatrist and put me on some drugs. <laughs> so, so the moral of the story is, I took one of my greatest weaknesses and turned it into my greatest asset. Because I learned to control that. I learned how to, how to harness it. I learned how to use that crazy attention thing, which spawned by like multimedia and video games and everything like that, into one of my greatest assets now, where I can do practically anything electronic. All right, so because of that, in school, I was, day, I was daydreaming, I was bored, um, as, uh, I had average scores, I, did, I actually flunked the class, um, pre-calculus, which is kind of funny because I'm Chinese, I should know math. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was really disengaged because, uh, because, the, because I felt that I was smarter than the teachers. Anybody have students like that in your class? Yeah. All right, well, the difference is, I was smart in my teacher. <laughs> so, so, so because of that, you know, I didn't fit the academic model of the system because I, I had all these problems, quote, unquote. Because I love video games. I am so well, well adapted to video games, I could school any of your kids on any game. In fact, like, this is a skill, and actually, I wonder if it could be a marketable skill, where I could actually pick up a game and master it within three hours, figure out the system, disseminate the, the, the logic behind it, and really figure out all the motivation because I, am, I have played it so much that I can, 
identify all these things. So, Actually, yeah, he, he was doing it until about two o'clock last night when he should have been getting some sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the night prior, yeah, I, yeah, I downloaded a game on my iPad. It was a bad idea. So, so but I also know it's one of my, my biggest weaknesses too, because I don't play much video games anymore because I stay away from it. It's like a drug for me. I mean, I have, I'm really addicted to games. World of Warcraft, don't touch it. You know, Diablo three. I've been waiting for that game for like 10 years, and, and I can't play it because I know it'll suck my life away. So, so you know, so as an adult, I have some restraint now, <laughs> and, and I and I pick up some games. So you guys are sitting here, and why are you listening to me? You know, Jonathan just said he came from Wilner's school, so he's not of the, the most highest academic mind. You know. <laughs> I do get the highest marks in my school. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but he found a modality that works for him. You know, here I am. You know, I don't have a, a PhD. I don't have like a. I didn't write, write a book. I didn't really do anything to to give me street credits, so to speak. So, so you know, why are you guys listening to a kid talk about game theory? And who uh, who said it at this conference? I think it was Ray who said it, that we need to survey our. Yes. Exactly. So here I am. So the secret in the sauce is the box. Now, everyone's heard of the overused term, think outside the box. Exactly. Well, here's the difference. I was never in the box. So because I was never in the box, I didn't have the constraints that you educators had to deal with. So I have friends in education, and, and, and they're like, you know, and, and as I was developing the company, I was creating solutions for them. I was watching them, and I go, why are you doing this over again? Why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? And they say, well, because I have to, because the rules state that, because this, that, or the other. And I'm like, well, there's got to be a better way. So over the course of years, like, you know, I figured out ways to break the rules, so to speak, because I never knew the rules to begin with. So, so that gave me the ability to freely think about the education system to be able to, to come from a different perspective and think not outside the box but but think like beyond the box because our biggest dream is that we want to fix the system it's a rat nest of uh, thing. Um, actually I'm not going to go through this because I'm going to skip that so one of the first things that we are we looked at is uh, the curriculum so the first problem is that most curriculum that I've seen out there uh, is can it's canned in some, a certain way because some uh, author or some expert um, decided to do it that way. And they say, okay, this is the best way to teach us. But does that ever happen uh, in the school? Does that happen to, when it, you give a teacher a canned curriculum? Do they teach exactly the way it is? No. Everybody wants to customize it. They want to make it their own. They want to change it. And that's one of my first beefs with, with curriculum. It's like, I want to make it flexible. The second problem that I've... Uh, recently encountered is there's a plethora of free resources out there. You know, there's YouTube, huge amount of resources. Wikipedia, that's you know, another thing. Uh, education sites that are uh, popping up all over the place with free resources. Uh, TED and Khan Academy. You know, these, these resources are wonderful, but there's a plethora of them. And, you know, it's eventually going to come to a point where we're all going to get overwhelmed by, the, by all that. So I'm going to pass it on to Jonathan now, and he's going to talk about some Keep yeah, this is just, I'll just go over this really quickly because I actually heard a few people, I was surprised to mention Speak Up at this conference, which is a good thing. We've been following the survey for about four and a half years, and I think it's just a really good indicator of where the mobile technology is in schools and how we can bridge that gap. Because when we started, we had dreams of doing this, and we were doing computers in culinary classrooms, which was crazy. I mean, there might have been one computer in a culinary classroom in the United States. So to see this shift has been really important for us. Basically, just the, the sheer increase in the last two years from 30% to 75% of high school kids having mobile devices in their pocket, internet ready, that's pretty huge. Part of it um, has been the shift from the parents as well. And parents are now saying they want to extend those learning opportunities outside of class. And this survey was 50% of, of parents have finally agreed. And partly, that's probably due to the fact that parents now are comfortable with mobile devices themselves in the last few years. They got their phones, they got their iPads, and they're seeing really the benefits of using that for education. Um, so to summarize that, it's 99% of the students want their textbooks completely online. Federal mandates say that we're gonna go completely digital in five years. Um, this is happening, 93% of the parents agree with this. 
But the fact of the matter is that as of last year's survey, only 47% of teachers, or I'm sorry, 47% say they use no digital aids whatsoever in their classroom, which to me is just mind blowing. But um, I have a feeling that's gonna change dramatically in the next year. So what, are, what did we do? Just uh, as a precursor for what I was gonna show you with our program, basically, we took the textbook model and disaggregated it. We broke the textbook into smaller concepts and that allowed us to do some really cool programming things with it. Um, we put it into concept containers that are basically individual knowledge objects, which you'll see, which allowed us to do concept-driven mastery. And basically the student will go through those materials on their own time, uh, in the bus, uh, after school, at their sporting events, uh, and then you can see the data real time and see how they're doing so you're more prepared to coach them in class. This is all the goal of having creating a fully personal uh, online personal learning environment. Um, basically, the pick and choose education model. This is where we're headed to adapt to the students and the teachers how they use it. Um, to integrate multiple sources, which we'll show you, to pull those videos off of Khan Academy and integrate them into the <coughs> lessons so it's all one unified experience. And then long term thinking, the real long term thinking, tying in the next generation assessments and things like that, is incorporating project based learning or problem based learning into the model and actually having the system track that portfolio for the students. So that's where we want to go in the future. All right, I'm going to introduce this quick funny video. I don't know how, how exactly it does it. I'll send click in the middle. Okay. If anybody uh, is a geek here, they might know the show Big Bang Theory. I'm not quite a fan. Favorite show. <laughs> but everybody I work with is absolutely sold on it. This just shows you how kids are with the uh, technology these days. Play. Click. It's not playing. It's broken. It worked as a piece Well, then I'm going to go to a manual. Okay. Technical difficulties. Gotta love that. <laughs> as you can see, we're always a work in progress. I know what happened. Does that mean the other videos won't work as well? No, it's not that. I did the wrong. You did something wrong. Yes, I did. That makes us feel really good. Yeah. Silly me. It was going so smoothly, too. Okay, we're going to stick this in here, and then I'm going to pour in the milk. I hope this works because I didn't bring a change of pants. Look, I googled it. It's a fake pigeon. So, I mean, that's just a, a really funny uh, illustration of like, you know, how kids are used to having information in their pocket. They, they grow up, they're growing up in a world where, where they never had to really work for the information. It's always there in their hands. And we need to harness that power, you know, in education. Uh, any, anybody remember the day when you had to go look up a 1967 article from Time that's on page 67? Let's see here, what steps did you have to go? Go to the microfiche, you search through all these articles, and you eventually find it, and then you can print out a blue carbon copy of it. Oh, it's kind of funny, you're hearing that from me too, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, like, you know, so the information's out there, and we just need to be able to harness that information. So, what does that lead to us, us to? We're actually in the revolution right now. And it's really exciting because, and you know, we say we're, our, you know, with this, because it's an evolution of education. We're actually in it, and it's happening all around us. Innovation is, is such a great thing because in the past like couple years, we've seen so many great, uh, great innovations in education. There's hundreds of startups popping up all over the place, like in Silicon Valley, in New York, it's all over the place. I mean, everybody's looking to figure out ways to improve education, which is great because we need the attention, we need the help. And because of the, the government stating we need to change and we need to create technology and education, this has spurred a whole new movement. So lots of people are funding it. There's a lot of uh, great little ideas coming up. And like you know, just for example, like you know, we bring up Khan Academy. You know, what a wonderful 
uh, piece of technology to bring the attention to center stage about education and flipping the classroom. You know, everybody here heard of School of One? You know, School of One. Awesome innovations in doing multimodality uh, education for students. But one of the things that we've seen in all this innovation out there is that they focus on math and science. Math and science. Because it's easy to create innovation. It's formulaic, it's algebraic. It's, you, you have a, a, a basically almost a fixed path, so it's really easy to predict. So what about the rest of us? What about the liberal arts? What about the career tech ed? You know, how do we t have innovation in those fields? Do we wait for them to adapt a math model to, uh, to our fields, or any other field other than math and science? Well, let's go ahead and I'll have to, oh wait. No, <laughs> that's right. You know, so, so I want to tell you that you know, it's exciting. Because for the past 12 years, you know, I've been working on building a solution. And it was birthed out of career technical education. The first thing I developed was a culinary arts curriculum. And that was basically my basis of how I created uh, all this technology. Because I, I started out not in math and science, but in culinary arts. And I had to make it work in culinary arts. So because of that, I had to develop a system that worked well in nonlinear subjects. Because the teacher can go practically anywhere, all across the country. It's all different. So I couldn't create a canned curriculum. The system is scalable, meaning that one of the biggest focuses when we started was to make sure that whatever we develop, uh, with, with that in mind, we could actually apply it to other fields too. So this has been a long work in progress. It didn't happen overnight. It wasn't like I dreamt up something like, hey, let's create this. You know, it's a lot of trial and error. And the most important thing is that it's organic. It adapts to the students and the teacher. Because that's one of the things I've seen in, in, in education is like teachers are constantly doing things. And why, 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 why do you have to keep doing the same steps over and over again when it could just all be handled by a system, which I'll show you in a minute. And the last thing is that it's easy to use. And this is key. My first market was not uh, a computer uh, teacher. My first market were chefs. Now chefs, now, I'm not knocking chefs here, but, but most of them are not the most computer literate in the world. So I had to make sure that it worked for them <coughs> before I make it work for anyone. Well, they've else. got more important things to do, like actually cooking the food. So yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, so so a lot of them the computers are important to them, and the first time they use it, they go, oh, I can use this. So that's really important to me. So I'm gonna uh, have a great quote from Dr. Sue Gendron. Uh, yesterday, <laughs> she said that like technology needs to be integrated with knowledge in our session. Technology needs to be integrated with knowledge. And that's very important. So, talking about tests. Yeah, the, the, big, the big thing we want to talk about is how, how this works, how we reimagine the test. Um, what we really wanted to do is take the fear out of testing and make it part of the learning process. And that's really key. It's also, from a programming standpoint, it's how you actually get all that valuable data so that you can make some of the game theory assumptions that we'll be talking about. The problems with tests, we all know. The summative test is necessary, but how do you take the fear out of it? How do you take the high stakes testing away and build confidence for the students? That's ultimately what we want to do. And basically what we're going to show you is that we're going to flip the tests with ARMS. So we call it ARMS, it's Adaptive Remediation and Mastery System. Basically what Nye is about to show you is how the test actually reformulates into a, into a process that the students are invested in, as opposed to being scared of. So let me pass it back over to him for that. Yeah, we're, we're doing a lot of juggling here, right? <laughs> I like it that way, it keeps it dynamic, you know. You gotta take a break to drink water every now and again. I know! It's <laughs> a good point. Alright, so right now I'm going to show you the, uh, the, the platform. So what you're seeing here is, this is um, a learning module that that we created. And Who's a, that? I don't know. He's a handsome Chinese guy, right? <laughs> All right. So one of the first things you, you see is like you know, we have pages. Now these are what we call concept pages. So each of these is an individual concept. And then we have our learning objectives. Now, so nothing, nothing new there. And you can actually add your own objective just by like, you know. So you, so one of the first things we'll demonstrate is like you know you can customize it and do things to it. And then, um, there it is. And then uh, we have like, you know, these rating systems. I won't go into details, but intermediate, advanced, basic. We have an algorithm that reads the data and also usage, which Jonathan will go into later. 
Uh, and the team names means that their mastery level pages are in these resources. So this is basically uh, a learning module. And in the learning module, we're expecting our students to learn all this information. So they start with page one. Who more know this? So, yay. <laughs> and then they move through the content, much like a book. Now these are all individual concepts. So everything in the content field here supports that concept. So on and so forth. Biological hazard. And it's really important to, that we break it down in concepts because that's the direct feedback that the students will get. Uh, actually, I'm going to go back to the biological hazard. One, one of the cool things that we've done and we haven't seen anyone else do in, in education is that we created a feature called key points. Basically, what it means is that any, any large body of text, we have the Cliff Notes version. But we can't call it that, of course. But we have a summarized version. So we're actually doing things to help aid the students as well. Anything we can do to get them engaged, to get them through the content, that's our goal. And then we go through the content. Um, so after they've gone through all the content, then what they do is they check their knowledge. Now this is very important. We don't call it a test, we don't call it a quiz. We want to change the language. We want them to check their knowledge. This is basically how they would find out and find the, how much they didn't know the information and get feedback. So I create this tab, and you can see I put a custom question in there. So the test is created, it's randomly generated. Now it's not randomly generated from test <coughs> bank, it's actually randomly generated from lots and lots of micro test banks. So I'm going to go over here to the test tool and wait for it to load. You don't want to minimize the profile too. Oh, yeah, a little more space on this projector. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't need to see that guy. Oh, there is. Go away, go away. All right, so, so you see this is the test tool, and you can see one of the first things we do is we incorporate Bloom's taxonomy. So every single question has a Bloom's rating. Now we see there's foodborne illness, first concept, lots of questions. Chemical fields and hazards, lots of questions, biological hazards. So you can see that one of the things that we have is that right off the bat, we have a lot of questions in our, in our database. Because one thing we wanted to do is make sure that the, the uh, students are properly assessed and that we keep them guessing too. We use a, uh, a theory called the abundant assessments in our response theory, which basically means that we, through lots and lots of questions, we could, we could gauge aptitude. So what happens and when they go through and they answer all the questions is that if they were to get all the questions correctly for, let's say, foodborne illness, then the system will tell them, congratulations, you have, you have uh, remediated that content. You could, we will remove it from your working bin and place it into your dub bin. So good, you know, you don't need to study that anymore because you, sh you showed proficiency in it because of that uh, randomized test. Now, if they don't get it correctly, we tell them, you need to go back and study food board notice. That's it. What question did I get wrong? We're not going to tell you that. Because what we're going to tell you is that you have not uh, achieved the mastery level of that content. So we don't tell you what you got right. We don't tell you what you got wrong. We just told you that you are a novice at foodborne illness. So every single concept that is in the system that they didn't fail to achieve mastery in, then they would be they would told the knowledge level and so that they could continue to level up. So the focus would narrow down to, from let's say 10 pages down to five pages, they iterate again, and then and they study those five pages, and they'll be down to two pages, and eventually they get down to the last page where they really narrow the focus. So that way, we're creating high rigor in the system so that they could go in and uh, <coughs> study and learn the information. And also, I'd like to add there, well, I'll explain a little bit of it later, but from the student's experience, there's actually some game mechanics that make them motivated to go and try that test again and take that test. It's not just like, oh, you didn't get anything right. Uh, it's basically get, get good feedback, and then the students can be engaged and say, oh, okay, I want to, I want to achieve that next medal or that next badge. So, there's one, one thing that, I don't know, I guess mine's not on. Oh, it's it, but there's one thing I wanted to say about that, um, because it's kind of important, and, um, when they don't tell you what you got, you know, it's a short amount of information. So they don't, they're not learning like big lessons. These are small lessons. But if it, they don't tell you what you, you, know, you got wrong, the, in the brain theory, and if, you're, if you take a look at that, so what it's doing is they're going back to study everything. Because if you tell them exactly what they got wrong, first of all, they won't go study anything else. Second is that they may have guessed somewhere along the line. And so they're not sure whether they actually had some things right or some things wrong. So it, it starts to get them to the point of creating, they question themselves, where high rigor comes in. Because when you use multiple choice assessment or any type of assessment where there's just, it's not, you know, writing long paragraphs, you can actually, in a multiple choice environment, 
get kids to think. Is that, I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but what happened, it makes them pause. And like, oh, was that was I right or not right on that? So there's a real theory behind there that a lot of brain scientists have been working on because there is the advantage to doing it this way. So it's, it, it actually pushes them, if you think of the rigor relevance framework, if you think of quadrant A, which a lot of people say, oh, quadrant A is office. Well, quadrant A is necessary, okay, because it's a skill. And what it does, it actually moves them to the middle of quadrant A, in the upper right-hand corner of quadrant A, where it's really close to being engaged in the quadrant D and all the others. It's a very high level of quadrant A. It's not just, it's not just I, I got it, it's I really know it. And that's what's really intriguing about the, um, the metrics that they've designed in the system. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Ray. What's your pass percentage? What's the pass percentage? I'll actually go over those okay. stats at the end. Yeah, sure. Great. <laughs> in color and arts, too, which is usually not so great. Um, so, so, so you can see that, then, you know, we, we, we do keep them guessing because, because of the way that we administer the system. And one thing that, you know, as the students go through the content, you know, this is like a uh, learning module called eight dishes. And you can see these color indicators. These color indicates, indicators to me as a student that I need to go in and study moist teeth. I need to go, I don't need to study with steaks because I've already mastered that content. But that doesn't mean I need to forget that content because it might kick in a question that you answered correctly and if you get it wrong, ooh, there's hell to pay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so because like, you know, we, we, we detect guessing too. So we want to have consistent uh, right answers, consistent results. So as a student, I'm like, okay, well I need to study this, this, and this. I know what I need to focus on. I'm average on these ones over here and then I can focus on that. And the, the entire thrust of what we want to do is we want to build confidence in the student. Because right now, the way the testing system is, they cram, 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 they get a C, they move on to the next subject. Cram, 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 get a D, move on to the next section, subject. They're getting all this negative feedback, where now they can continue to get feedback until they get into the positive arena. And we build the confidence, confidence so that when they do take that summative test, when they do take that high, high stakes exam, they'll be ready and they'll be prepared for it and they'll feel very confident about it. So uh, one of the other things that, you know, talking about organic in the system is that we also want to make it uh, very flexible for the teacher to be able to add content. So I'm gonna go over here and I have this video that I wanna incorporate. So, I'm gonna copy this code here. And as he's copying this, I'll just say that basically we can add, you can add anything to the system, anything that has a web embed code, um, you know, PDFs, uh, Prezi presentations, uh, YouTube videos that you uploaded, that you streamed, that you downloaded, uh, put them in there and actually integrate it right with the module. So if you start with a block of content or you just want to populate it yourself, you can actually use this to incorporate all your resources and then test them on it. All right, so I just added that video. It's, a, it's a page 11. I'm moving it to the number two position. So I'm right now I'm formulating the learning module. So I want that to be the second thing the students look at. So I start with page one, and I move on to the next page. And here is the cat video. You can see how it's like it's part of that learning environment. So that they're moving on, and then when they're done with this, they move on to the next thing. Kind of focus on what it. So that's one of the key things about like creating this learning environment is that is that you, most times you, you tell them to go to a YouTube video if you can, they'll go to the link and then they'll get distracted. Now we have the ability to embed. I mean, embed is not something new uh, because I'm sure that a lot of you probably use that right now. But now we're in a learning environment, so it's all wrapped together in, in KP Compass. But one of the best things now is that now that you put this piece of content in here, I'm gonna come over here to the test tool and create a question about it. Now it's part of our mastery system. So now when they, when they go through the test, they'll get asked these questions, and if they get it wrong, they'll be told, you need to go and master cats are cool. And so on. So now you can choose between true or false, multiple choice, short answer. You can also include essays, but essays aren't automatically rated yet. That's a future project. Uh, and, be, and you can rate it by Blooms too. So there we have it. So, so that, that's, a, that's one of the, the things that we want to make sure is that it's a, it's a powerful tool, but it's also flexible. And you're probably thinking to yourself, okay, as a teacher, what do I get? Well, you get lots and lots of great data. And John is going to talk about our data, data analytics, but, but here is like an example of a class. And I can come down here, and I see that here's my class roster, and I can see where my students are across the board. Each, each learning module, the numbers in the parentheses represent how many times they iterated in the uh, knowledge check process. So you can see that some students require a lot of tries to get to Scholar. 
and then others may, may only need one try to get the scholar. So we, we allow them to be able to do that and, and express themselves. Now, if we look at this student here, 14, and she's still uh, in the red, then maybe we need to go help that student. So let's find out what's going on with Stacy here. So Stacy is having uh, issues in cooking techniques. So you see every single question they answered, right and wrong, so red represents wrong. And then this is really interesting down here. Under effects of food, we see that on Wednesday, she answered, on Janu in January, she answered it wrong. But on, in February, she got it correct. So you can see how that, how that information flips. And we're building alert systems in it so that we can alert you to students who uh, are like in, in uh, trouble waters, if, if they are, um, need extra attention, if they actually regressed instead of progress. So, so, you, so you have all this valuable data to be able to put you uh, in touch with the student and create that personal experience. So, back to the presentation. <laughs> Any questions? Like it? Is it cool? Yeah. yeah. I have a question. Are you able to like bulk upload questions, or do you have to manually like them? Uh, right now, manual, but we, we're working on a way to be able to bulk upload. But the problem is that you need to be able to associate it with content too. So we're going to be doing that a way to be able to make it an easy process. So right now it's just copy, paste, next, copy, paste, next. Okay, so actually I didn't get a chance to show you, but this is, uh, this is the student feedback page. And this is really important because it's part of the, it goes the, the segue into our game theory. So we have what John's gonna talk about, our KBOT system, stands for Knowledge Bot, and it's a, it travels the world, it tells you what, what level you are, how you're growing, and which, what, which areas you need to focus on. So very simple little feedback system. And, uh, and basically, Chromie travels the world, and he's in uh, Buenos Aires in this case. So, moving on. What we want to do, so like I said, we want to use the, the testing feedback system to help students learn. Build confidence, and because mastery is equal to informative success. And as uh, Ray was mentioning earlier, and I brought this up because, uh, yeah, but, but he stole my thunder. Where is he? <laughs> is that uh, uh, all you're saying there? Going, yeah, this is quadrant A. And everyone's like, we gotta stay away from quadrant A. Well, what I'm saying is that you guys need to stay away from quadrant A. Let us take care of quadrant A because we're evolving quadrant A from just st standard memorization to, like Ray said, right to corner before we cross over to quadrant D. Because what we're doing is we're giving you a tool so that you could cross over that to D very easily and move on to higher rigor relevance. So we're bringing students to here and then boom, you're up there. So I want to quote uh, another great man, uh, Dr. Daggett, uh, yesterday at Boston Schools Conference. He said, quadrant A is not bad. <laughs> quadrant A is not bad. It's essential, but it's only the beginning. And that's important. We still need quadrant A. Yeah, and basically the reason uh, why we need quadrant A is, is what he said. We want to save you time. We want to make it so that teachers uh, are ready. When they, they can look, take 10 minutes and view their class roster and see who needs the help before we come in uh, to that day's lesson. So basically, we want you to be able to teach quadrant A. All right, moving on to the meat of the, the subject, game theory. Now, why, why and how we implemented all this? But uh, I think right now, we're, what we want to do is... Uh, we want to pass out some iPads uh, and a laptop because we'll, instead of having you guys write a, a sign-up sheet, we actually did it uh, electronically. So, um, anybody wanted a, an iPad? Oh, here, catch! Oh, oh you missed! <laughs> Sorry, that was a gag. <laughs> <laughs> He's in on it too. <laughs> I love it. He bought that iPad from Taiwan, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, so basically, on the, so while I'm talking and you guys are distracted, uh, we have a, a, a basically a basic little sign-up sheet. And one of the things I want to do is get some feedback, but also uh, who, those who are interested in, in exploring this platform some more. Now, those of you who have uh, internet connection, you can just go to kpcurriculum.com slash msc.html, and you can fill out that form. Otherwise, I'm going to circulate this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> curriculum.com slash msc.html. So, you? Anybody still need that? Go grab the last one. Go grab the last one.
All right, so I also have an old-fashioned laptop. I'm going to start in the back. KPCurriculum.com slash MSC, Oxbow Conference, dot HTML. Sorry, we should have put that on the slide. Yeah. Yes, you should. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Look at that now. Well, we've got papers, too, if anybody wants to go that far. <laughs> Okay, so while he's uh, passing that out, I'm going to quickly introduce the, the game theory concept and, and basically, as he'll show you about... Uh, and nobody steal my iPad. Actually, let me let you handle the first part. Uh, yeah, oh yeah. Sorry. So, you know, game theory and gamification. So, this is the, this, one of the things I want you guys to understand is... Um, is our thought process with games. So this is this is the way I see kids of your generation, or I see like you know, the difference between your generation and my generation. So one of the things that you know as kids we love cartoons, right? You know we have Felix the Cat, you know Smurfs, uh, Mickey Mouse. So back then, your form of entertainment was sitting in front of the boob tube, right? <laughs> So, so it's passive entertainment. You're watching these characters, they're doing stuff, they're crazy antics, you're laughing, you're, you're engaged with them, and you're watching it passively. So that's passive entertainment. Now, when video games came out, we have new icons that, that kids look up to, such as Mario, Sonic the Hedgehog, Sol Solid State from Metal Gear Solid, uh, Link from, from uh, Legend of Zelda. So the biggest difference between then and now is that the kids are used to controlling the avatar rather than watching the avatar. They're controlling their, uh, their icons instead of just passively watching it. And because of that, because they're growing up with that level of control, they have a whole entire different sense of themselves. Because they want to control their destinies. They control Mario. Mario jumps into a pit. I learned that that kills me. So I'm going to jump over the pit and jump on the Koopa and run and get the star and, and, uh, and voila. So, so they're in control, and that's the thing that when they enter the education system, they're not in control. But with technology, we can give that control to the students because that's what they're used to. So one of the things that we've noticed is that most education games out there are cheesy. Well, except for Scholastic. That was cool. But, but the games are cheesy, and that creates disengagement with the students as well. Because if they, they look at it, they're like, this isn't like Mario. This is cheesy. Yeah, I'm forced to learn this. It may be engaging, but, but it's cheesy. You know? So well, I want to point out that game theory, in the way we see it, is not a game. I want to make sure to make that abundantly clear that game theory is not a game. Because the way we approach game theory is that we're using the theories behind games to create motivational aspects. So we, we are not creating a game, we're creating Game yeah, and I'll actually take it from there. That's perfect. I want to give a quick introduction on what game theory is for, for anybody that, uh, that doesn't know this concept. And basically, it's used in political science. It's used in economy every day. You probably use it all the time. You don't even realize it. But really, uh, the simplest way of saying it, anybody play chess or poker, uh, you're probably implementing game theory when you're trying to track patterns and look backwards in time to the beginning of the game. That's really what the gamer is doing. Um, in the simplest form, think of paper, rock, scissors. If you know that every, every third time somebody's going to throw that same thing to try to throw you off, you're one step ahead of them. So game theory really has three different applications. The first, the first point of it is that it's really just the, mathematical, uh, the mathematics of human choices, really. That's the simplest way to say it. Uh, it's putting math to this human elements. For students, what this means is, as the gamer, we want them to stay, the mask to stay on the system so that they're constantly trying to figure it out. Like Nye said, he masters the game in three hours, and then the student's done. So you have to have a very a relevant game that continues to evolve so that the students are constantly engaged with the system. For teachers, it means efficiency. What we want to do is create the system, like we talked about, that'll, that'll give you more time, and that'll let you hone in on specifically what students need. And all that data is collected. And for us, it means constant improvement on the system, keeping the, uh, the wizard behind the curtain, so to speak, and making, the, making sure the students are constantly looking to achieve that next level and learn that next concept. So how do we do it in our system? This is the most simple representation because we don't have time to go into a lot of the details. We have a KBOT system that stands for Knowledge Bots. This is one way that we motivate, but um, basically this is Chromie. 
Chromie starts out as a little bucket. Um, it's nothing more than a simple avatar, but as the students learn and continue to engage themselves in the system, they travel, they get different parts, it levels up, um, and their experience changes. Uh, we're exploring this in many, many different ways. We want to make it fully customizable for the students. The next way is really through rewards and motivation. And this is the big one, um, to keep students completely engaged in the system. The most important concept behind, behind this theory is intrinsic versus extrinsic rewards. Extrinsic rewards are terrible. It means I'm, not, I'm, or I'm only going to do my homework because so-and-so teacher is going to have my ass, frankly, if I don't. So that's an extrinsic motivator. That's very, very bad in education. And unfortunately, that's really how the system's built. So what we want to do is if you, if you look at intrinsic, how do you measure that? Well, if we have a students on their iPad using our system and we're giving them extrinsic motivators like achieve this level of mastery by a certain time, that's fine. But what happens when you leave the room, when you say, okay, uh, the extrinsic motivators are over, we're going to take a lunch break. Are the students still interacting with the system? That's how you measure the intrinsic value and that's what we're trying to do. So really we do it in a number of ways. We funnel them through the path of least resistance, through that remediated content that I showed you. We also let them explore with K-Bots, and we, we make sure that it's not linear. They can go anywhere where they want to. They can learn anything that the teacher assigns or, or puts into their bed. Also, we lead them. Uh, this is the big one. You want to level up. You want to level your character up. You want to get to that next achievement. And that's what I was talking about. That's the, the main motivator, actually, is just, hey, I want to achieve level six or level seven. And we also embed competition between the students as an option. So the, the teachers can let the students see the leaderboard for a specific module or for a specific course. And that's a very big motivator for the students. And finally, collecting and badging, which is huge. And I'll go into that uh, in a little more detail. I'd like to uh, mention first Mozilla badges. Does anybody know about Mozilla badges? Has anybody heard about that? I only see like one or two hands. It's a really fascinating concept. And here on the right, um, you probably can't see this diagram very well. The basic concept of Mozilla badges is kind of what we're doing. We want to integrate those into our system as well. But basically what it is, is to create badges that measure a uh, student's achievement. Um, you got a certification, or perhaps uh, you did an internship. And, and basically the badges are assigned through Mozilla by the issuer. It could be an after school program, it could be a formal institution, it could even be an employer. And really moving forward into the future, they're trying to create a global initiative where badges that go into a student's a learner's digital backpack basically go with them for life and will have as much weight as any certification you get or any diploma you get. And I think we all know that work experience is, is very important. It's in most cases more important, you know, once you have the job than your actual education. So Tying that into education and moving backwards into the system is very big because the students can actually start getting some of these accolades and badges and take them with them while they're in school. So in that sense, it's achievement versus assessment. And it really proves that games work and they actually are going to get you to work. So with that in mind, really what we want to do is we want to create an addiction to actual learning. And with that, I'm right, passing the mouse around. So yeah, what we want to do is create an addiction, just like how I have an addiction to, to computer games. We want to mimic that addiction with our students. We want them to be addicted. You know, it's not something that we want to say, but actually, we think, I think I heard uh, uh, Dr. Daggett say that, uh, that or somebody, I'm trying to remember, that, that we want to create that level of addiction because that really creates the, that engagement, and we can do it. So speaking of addictions, um, Last fall, we experimented our system when we first launched our, our entire testing game mechanics in full, full fury at the ACTE National Conference, which is the Association for Career and Technical Education. So at the conference, we launched this and made it open for teachers to, to jump on board and try it out. So you got to imagine, you're at a conference and you're told, hey, you know, try this uh, uh, application out. And they go in and they actually do it. So here's some of the teachers that I actually talked to. Um, this is Michelle Green, and she's a first year teacher, so she's a young one, and she's gonna talk about how she experienced the system during that conference. Yeah, it's been really fun, and I played a lot, and the answers are very difficult, but um, I've learned more than I ever thought I ever would about CTE. This is my first conference, national conference, and my first time in St. Louis, and my first time using KB software in this way, and it was really easy, and really fun. Yeah, that is definitely 
choppy video as you can see like you know this is a, a teacher a teacher actually addicted to the system which is really uh, an exciting thing for us because when we when we launched it we didn't know how people would react we even didn't know that they'd be disengaged especially as adults but so 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 she's a first year teacher a young one right <laughs> now what about the rest of us well here's another one and actually marcy uh, we, had a, we had a leaderboard that was going on too, so people actually knew what knowledge level they were at versus everyone else. We don't, we don't make that open for students, but during this test we made it open. But you as a teacher get to see the leaderboard so you can see where everyone's at as far as knowledge points. Alright, so this is Marcy. She is not a young teacher, and she actually made it pretty high up on the standings too, so this is another. Uh, Lost sleep. I, did not sleep I I'm sorry. Okay. I, I saw your name go. advocacy, uh, phone numbers of, of, of different key members. They had to learn all that through that process. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like telling somebody, hey, go memorize the phone book. <laughs> you know, so, so it wasn't like fun information about things that, you know, it's, they're interested in ACT, of course, but it wasn't, you know, the, like, you know, sewing or, or cooking or, or, some, or, or automotive or, or, or sports. So the best part about what we've done with the system is that it's not scripted. The system just works. All we need is content to put into it. It's content agnostic. So that means that you don't have to have a Hollywood budget to create game theory. Because one thing we've done with our system is that we made it so that the game theory wraps around whatever the content it is. And, that, and, and that's the beauty of it. You don't have to create, craft, or do anything. It's all non-scripted. That's, that's, that's our entire emphasis, that we don't want to make it so that uh, it's a path. We're using algorithms. We're using data. We're using all these different things to be able to create the, the paths for a student. So with that, our goal is to create student-centered and teacher-driven. It's important, teacher-driven. Because a lot of people would want to say that we should remove the teacher, but we still want to put the, the driver's seat in the teacher's hands. You know, you, you could go ha hands-free if you want, but, <laughs> but, we, but we want to keep it that way. It lets you flip the classroom. So uh, in a minute, we're going to actually give you a, a chance to try, your, try it out yourself if you have a mobile device. But I'm going to have Jonathan talk about this a little yeah, bit. Yeah, really quickly about data. We're running a little short on time, so I'm going to fly through this. I don't need to belabor the point about what student-centered learning is. You know that. But one thing I'd like to point out is that in all the sessions I attended, I didn't see anybody really talking about the pitfalls of flipping your class. And some of the problems with it, I mean, uh, it's one thing, con videos are out there, but how do you really know that the students understand the content? I mean, you still have to, to have some way of measuring that. So as you can see with our system, that's really what, what our focus is. We want to make it so that you can absolutely measure that, uh, so that you can actually do the flipping without worrying about you know, not being a teacher. So 
little bit big picture thoughts about data and analytics and how this plays into our big um, thoughts about game theory. Basically, SEM recommendations. Every time you log into Amazon, you see so and so bought this and all this recommendations, all this spooky personalization on Facebook, all these Google AdWords. This is amazing marketing materials. So much money is funneled into this, but where is it for education? It's all driven by data, and there's some amazing things you can do with that data. It's just, it's, it's almost a mystery why there's not more of it in education. We see that as our opportunity, so that's what we're doing. Really, the goal is to have big data analytics. Uh, this is a term that's been funneled through, you know, IBM back in the day and all the way, you know, it's, it's really popular right now. But really what it means is that every interaction in the system is tracked. When students stop, uh, you know, start interacting with things in the bottom right corner as opposed to the upper left, our goal is to make sure that we stop putting things in the bottom right. We put them in the upper left. All their tests are tracked, how they interact, the times between the tests, if they bounce out of certain concepts. And what we do is we correlate that with a big pool of data, all the other users around the world. So basically, the system gets smarter. And then we're able to make some very interesting predictions about their performance. What it actually will mean is suggestions alerts for the teachers, suggesting even potentially their education paths, their career paths, tying it to like-minded people, collaborating with people who could actually be very good mentors for your learning style. And what I love about this, the career paths is like, you know, you know how, how effective is like going to a guidance counselor and then you fill out the little survey and it tells you you should be a nurse or a doctor because it's based on your responses. Now we're actually doing it based on the concepts that they mastered all that information is stored in the student's profile so that, so that we can actually create a, a, and craft something and suggest something that would be very applicable to them. And then the guidance counselor can actually be focused on building a relationship, which is what they should be doing, in my opinion. So that's real world, in our opinion. That's actually a, a perfect example of relevance. And I'm going to sign off my, my part of the presentation with this slide. You were asking about the stats. Um, basically, we've done you know, almost 10 plus years of summative assessment style learning. In our software version, we had a version that was very much very similar. Even though it was cool, it was very similar to the, the classical testing models. Now we've moved outside of that. You can see the numbers. We, we tested about 250,000 people in this example on the summative test versus 10,000 in the new cloud-based online formative testing. You can see the difference. The average teacher time per module for a learning concept was about 12 hours. That included grading, uh, pre-class time. Now we got it down to three hours. Um, basically, the student time, they're so much more engaged with the content. And in class, you can't measure that engagement. You don't know if they're daydreaming about you know, what they were doing before class. But in, in the technology world, it's actually required. Every interaction proves that they're, they're engaged. And we can measure that very accurately. The assessment points, the actual number of questions they, they would take for any given module, 25 to 30 in the old system, now 150 to 250, and they're enjoying it. Speed of completion, three times faster. And in fact, we had a gentleman from the, the Job Corps Center who's looking at federally adopting our system for all of their centers, um, say that his students were flying through the content so fast that he actually had to slow them down because their model didn't allow for that. Um, their retention, even though they're learning more material, is quite a bit higher. In some cases, double what, what it would be. And we do surveys to test that, you know, give them a test six months later, three months later. Um, and also, obviously, all the intangibles, the competition, the big data analytics, and the big one I didn't really mention is test overlay. We have a way in our system right now, which we can show you later if you're interested, for a teacher to say, okay, I want to see how my students would do on this test. You input those questions, you select them, and then your students will actually, you'll get a, a degree of certainty. And say, Janie, with a 94% certainty, is going to achieve a B on this test, whereas Michael is going to achieve a D. So you can go focus your efforts on Michael. And that's really what we're trying to do. So with that, we're going to turn it back over to nine. Talk about science fiction, right? <laughs> but the thing is, all these things are possible with data. And that's the important thing. So if you want to try it yourself, we've created a uh, course online so you can actually sign in and try it out. And then there will there'll be like a <coughs> coloring arts uh, modules. And also, you know, there's also a, a module on rigor and relevance too. So you can see how the information is. Try it yourself as a student. See how the motivation and feedback works for you. And, uh, and, and give it a try. So, that's the website. You need to create an account or log in with Facebook or Twitter, which is really simple and easy. Just if you have a Facebook, Twitter, Google account. Uh, and then uh, make sure to click on preview new, new look. In the past uh, three weeks, we've uh, launched a new 
uh, platform. Basically, we constantly re uh, reinvent ourselves. We do it like pro practically every six months because we need to keep up the pace. So, so every summer and every winter, we go through an, a, another iteration of our platform. So we just, we're just launching this one because summer is a great time to, to do a lot of experiencing. So create a new look, it's important, and then uh, take the test, all right? So everyone got that? Yeah. All right, so one thing I want to uh, conclude with is our vision. Our vision is to revolutionize education, and the information is still down here if you need it. That's what we want to do. That's what we set out to do. Uh, all those years back, is to revolutionize education. That was my heart dream, was to do something that really is earth shattering. We also want to change the textbook industry. We want to make it so that the, the textbook industry and the stranglehold that they pull, pull over us isn't there anymore. Disaggregating the textbook, making it so that you're teaching a class you can pull from the math, the math book, the science book, the social studies book, and the culinary arts book, and you can take all these different things and place it into a learning module so that you could create that, uh, that quadrant D uh, project-based learning. We want to make it student-centered and mobile first. So that's really key, because a lot of people are developing things that aren't mobile ready, or they're trying to adapt to mobile. And that's one of the things that we set out for the get-go. We didn't start developing the online system until the iPhone came out. Then we're like, okay, this is our goal. Make it mobile first, not flash-driven, so it works on everything. And we want to create the epic win. Great <laughs> that. The epic win. Because the, at the end of it, we want to make learning fun. Make it an engagement. So, in the end, you know, the late Steve Jobs. We, we, I only put this up here because he created a company that embodied his vision. To be able to stand at the intersection between technology street and liberal arts streets. And he created the perfect marriage of engineers and consumers so that everybody can use the devices that he creates. It doesn't have to, you don't have to be a programmer or an engineer or, or a rocket scientist to be able to do it. And we take that same model of approach. Because we have the focus in culinary arts, because we're all technical geeks, we're, we're, we have that marriage. And we wanted to make sure that that stays from our culture. So, demand a revolution. Don't sell for less. You know, Require more from publishers, because the force needs to come from you. You need to be the ones who need to say to them, hey, why don't you adopt a mastery system? Well, what mastery system? Well, you know, there's a split company called KP, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so with that, you know, what I want you to do is I want you to start using our technology to create lessons. You can do it as an individual teacher to flip your class. We're making the platform uh, open and available for, for beta users right now because we want people who are really want to experiment and actively engage with it. You know, we also want to look for partner school districts too. Right now we're partnered up with a couple school districts who are really forward thinkers and, and, and they're actually starting to implement our system with, within their, uh, their curriculum. And, and so that also we could share your lessons in the class. So encourage others to do so, spread the word, go to kpcompass.com, your course code is ICLE12, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you.